thinking better and thinking together about life's most important issues. A place to finally meet in the middle, to think freely and reasonably about the big questions of life. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome to another episode of Thinker Sensitive. My name is Ryan Ragazine, and I am your host. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than the usual. Over the last couple months, I've had the opportunity to do some interviews where I've asked others to share their unique stories on the podcast. But I realized that I've never fully shared my story in much detail on the show. I had the pleasure of making a guest appearance on the Halfway There podcast with Eric Nevins, a Denver seminary grad who lives in my neck of the woods. His show focuses on the peculiar stories and life experiences of his guests. I had the opportunity to talk about my personal journey on his podcast. Today's episode will revolve around that interview. People tend to gravitate towards stories. Shared human experience allows us to relate to the stories of others and to connect with them in a special way. I hope my story, which is ever unfolding, having a beginning but no end, speaks to you in the fluidity of your story in some way. And I truly hope that whatever word my story speaks is something of worth, something of value, something that meaningfully impacts your history and your story, which is every bit as important as mine. Okay, well, friends, let's let's bring in our guest today. He is one of my fellow podcasters. He's the host of Thinker Sensitive, Ryan Ragazine. Ryan, welcome to Halfway There. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I am glad that you're here. And uh, we've been getting to know each other over the last, I don't know, couple of months or so. And I'm excited to hear a little bit more about your story. Uh, your podcast, Thinker Sensitive. Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, Thinker Sensitive was a podcast that I had kind of revamped and relaunched last summer. And so I've been doing it since maybe July of last year or August of last year. Um, But before that, I had been kind of mapping it out, preparing it, uh, putting together all the content. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to get way ahead on content so that I could uh, do the podcast without feeling pressure about um, having to come up with new ideas and and write new stuff. So the podcast is really meant to inspire people to think well and communicate well about the big questions of life. And it's a podcast for thinking seekers. The goal is is really um, to get people to think soundly and ethically and communicate soundly and communicate ethically about life's most important questions, whether those questions are um, social and cultural or political or whether they're more in terms of big philosophical questions and theological questions. Um, So I think the content can be appealing for people both within the church and outside the church, um, because we deal with questions that are really, um, that are really universal human questions, I think. Yeah. Okay. So why that show? Like why, why are you looking for thinking seekers? Because, that's kind of who I am. Mm. Um, and it's really, I think in a lot of ways, the podcast is a culmination of my personal journey, Mm. um, and my spiritual journey. And so, yeah, it just makes sense, um, that my podcast is kind of a reflection of my history, I guess. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, that's what we do here. We, we get into your, uh, story, your life with God. And so I want to hear about some of that. Uh, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? 
I grew up in uh, Detroit, Michigan. So I was born there and I grew up right outside the city. And um, if you've ever been to Detroit, Michigan, it can be a bit of a depressing place. Yeah. Um, but I also have very fond memories uh, there. And, and um, so many of my close friends still live there. My parents still live there. And so I always enjoy going out to visit. Um, but when I left Michigan, I realized how gloomy it was. Uh, now, I, I don't think you realize it until you leave the state. It's a lot like, you know how people talk about Seattle with like seasonal depression. Uh -huh. and it's always cloudy. I would say Michigan's even worse because at least in Seattle, you have the ocean and you have mountains and um, it's very just a beautiful place. Not that Michigan isn't beautiful. It is. But uh, in the winter, you can go, yeah, like two or three months, I feel like without seeing the sun and it's just overcast all the time. So it's tough. It's, but, but with that said, it will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing to me about Detroit is it's an old city, right? Like it's, it is. Yeah. It's not, you know, much of the Midwest, like where I, I grew up in Des Moines. So it's, it's a ways from there, but still, still French. Right. So for that kind of influence. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it very, very, it's just really old. And so that's one of the reasons that it's kind of like, but it also is kind of cold. And that whole industrial thing is that we, Think about for a while. I was thinking about buying a whole city block in Detroit. I was like, "How could I make that happen?" Because that was happening for a while. <laughs> anyway, well, that's what I know of Detroit. So somebody yeah. probably can listen to this and set me straight on why that's not true or whatever. But that's okay. Uh, so, Ray, growing up in Detroit, what was that like? What was your what was your family like? What was your um, kind of spiritual climate that you were in? Yeah. So um, I grew up in a Christian home. And I was always very active in church, always very involved. Um, most of my friends, most of my like really close friends were friends from church. So I always had really good relationships with people from church. And that was like my main social base. Mm -hmm. um, so I always have very fond memories of, of growing up in church during that time. You were a youth group kid? I was. I was. Yeah. 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 I love that. Um, but when I was about 12 years old, I actually lost my faith in God. And that was kind of the beginning of my spiritual, spiritual journey in a lot of ways. Okay. Well, tell me that story. What happened? Cause that's not, not many 12 year olds go, oh yeah, <laughs> I just, I just checked my, the faith of my parents that are taking me to church every, every Sunday. So yeah, what happened and, and what was their reaction? Yeah. So I don't know if I had this habit um, every night, but I remember I remember the moment very vividly when I had this crisis of faith. And I was, yeah, I was about 12 years old. And I remember I was laying in bed and I was praying. And I don't know if I, I again, if I had this habit consistently of praying in bed or praying before I went to sleep. But I remember I was praying while laying in bed one night. And a thought, a question came to my mind. What if I'm talking to myself? And it was the first time I had ever questioned the existence of God. It was the first time that that thought had ever entered my mind. And it was life-changing at that point. It was earth-shattering shatter in a lot of ways. Um, and it created a real crisis in that moment. And in that moment, I lost my faith in God. Um, and it's interesting because losing my faith in God in that moment, um, I also lost a lot of other things with that. So with the loss of faith came a loss of a sense of identity came a loss of um, my understanding of reality and truth, um, a loss of a sense of meaning and purpose. And so when I think about that moment, when I reflect on it now, I think it says something about how utterly holistic faith is, how comprehensive it is, um, how faith is connected to so many other elements in our lives, our sense of identity, our sense of purpose, like all these other things. And so 
with that loss of faith came a loss of, of so much more than that. And it, it is weird to talk about because I was only 12 years old, but um, that's something that, that really shook me and, and kind of changed my, the trajectory of my life. And even at 12 years old, like I fell into like a kind of depression during that time. Yeah. So that's a really interesting question for a 12 year old to ask, although maybe it's not so abstract, right? Like that's kind of a, it's a pretty normal faith question to ask. A lot of people will ask that, right? Like, well, sure. how do I know I'm not just talking to my ceiling? Right. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm very interested in what you said as well, that there's, you know, you lose a lot of other things because your, your whole family, your whole social network, we're all kind of bound up in your faith. So what did that end up looking like for you? What what kind of what was the experience as you walked through? It? I mean, did you have mentors you could talk to, or what? Like, what happened? Did you start reading philosophy? <laughs> yeah, I, it's interesting. Okay, so I am extremely introverted, and I'm a very private person, and I internalize a lot of stuff. So I have a hard time. I think articulating my thoughts to other people sometimes, and especially at that time of, of my life. And so I actually didn't tell my parents this. And I only shared this with some of my closer friends at that time. And outside of that, I didn't really talk about this to anyone. I think it's hard to say why part of it is I was such a private person. Part of it is I was really shy Maybe I didn't want to disappoint other people or I felt embarrassed about it, but I continued to go to church during this time of my life and all throughout my teenage years and even like being very involved, but I wasn't at this place where I had this faith in God like my peers. And so during that time of my life, I definitely was agnostic. I, I could not believe in God during that time. And I think for me, though, it's interesting because I think I wanted to because I knew what I had lost, right? Like, because I had faith in God at one point and all that came with that, I knew what that entailed and I knew what I had lost. And in a sense, I wanted that back, but I think I was jealous of my other friends who went to church that they could just have faith in God in this kind of easy way that it was easy for them. But for me, I just couldn't get there. And I was kind of jealous of my friends. What was it that was bothering you? Uh, In terms of, in terms of what? Your friends, like they, so that you said they had it easy. What was it that made it hard for you? Oh, I, that's, that's a good question. I don't mean to say that they had it easy, but that like faith came, faith in God came more naturally. Yeah. And it, um, even if it appeared easy to them, right? Like that's yeah, yeah, totally yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, there were just a lot of intellectual stumbling blocks. Like for me, um, Faith in God was more a matter of the mind, something intellectual, than something that was based on feeling. Now I have a much more nuanced view, mm. right? But but at that time, it was all, an, it was an intellectual thing. And I couldn't, at the time, I didn't have the categories to think through those things. Um, like what? Just to think through just all the questions that I had about, and a lot of it had to do with um, not uh, knowledge and how faith and knowledge relate to one another and the issue of certainty and maybe feeling like in order for me to believe in God, I had to be like absolutely certain about his existence, as certain as I am that you exist right now as I'm seeing you right in front of me. Right. Yeah. So, wow. So that's really deep for a teenager to be asking all these epistemological questions, right? Like you're asking, how do I know? How do we know? How do we, how do we prove that? And, and you know, what is the percentage I have to be certain in order to actually 
call that yeah. faith? Like that's really, yes. yeah, really interesting questions. Okay, well, how'd you answer them? Yeah. So, and by by the way, wait, sorry. Before you answer that, oh, you no, never no. told your parents. Like you, you didn't tell your parents. No, like, all that whole no. time. No. Maybe, what? I mean, maybe that means I'm a horrible son. I, <laughs> I don't. But I, yeah, I think like maybe I was ashamed. Uh huh. Or maybe I felt like they wouldn't be able to understand. Sure. I'm not saying it was right, but maybe that's just how I felt at the time. Did you tell them eventually? No, I don't think I ever told them. They're going to listen to this podcast and they're going to go, oh my gosh, I didn't know Ryan was going through that. I think that they might know now. <laughs> oh, okay. Because, like, <laughs> I have this like long intro video to my podcast and I talk about kind of my my testimony and what I went through. And so I do mention this. So maybe they watch that and and yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. I just was trying to set the stakes for the show, right? No, no pressure. No pressure. Okay. So how did you resolve it? So what so what happened? Because you know, you're you're doing this podcast now for believers. So I'm guessing God did something. So let's hear that. Yeah. So I turned to philosophy to find answers during that time. And that didn't just involve reading philosophy and involved doing philosophy or becoming a philosopher. And philosophy really at its um, root or in its raw form is simply deep contemplation or reflection, right? So during that time of my life, as I had gotten a little bit older, like 16, 17, 18, I started to really dig deep into some of these questions and analyze them, reflect on them, contemplate. And I would spend hours and hours, days thinking about what I like to call the big questions of life. Um, And so it wasn't just reading philosophy, but it was doing philosophy. And I found a lot of solace in that because I was going through, um, where I did have all of these like intellectual blocks and I did need to just kind of assess all this stuff and think through it. And I needed time to do that. And so for me, it was kind of cathartic to do that as well. Um, But that's where my love of philosophy, I think really started to develop is when I was a teenager. Yeah. So you returned to philosophy. You're asking all these questions. Who's your favorite? Where, where did you, what did you enjoy reading? Oh, definitely at that time, um, the classical Greek philosophers. So Plato, Aristotle, the pre-Socratics. Um, and I would say for anyone who is interested in philosophy, but hasn't really um, gotten into it in depth or it doesn't know where to start, I would say start there. Because I think Plato is one of the easier philosophers to really understand. I think Socrates is as well. And so that's a great place to start. They, the classical Greek philosophers write in a very clear way. Mm. If you're, do not start with modern philosophers. No Kierkegaard to start out? No, do not start with Kierkegaard. <laughs> do not, um, because yeah, they're very tricky. The, the language is tricky, the translations. And also modern philosophers tend to make up a lot of words. And, and they tend to use words, the same words in very different ways. So like Kant will use a word, the same word that Locke uses, but he'll use it in a completely different way. Yeah. And so it's very tricky. Start with the, with the Greek philosophers for sure. Yeah. So you got to define your terms. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Plato is pretty foundational as well, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. uh, Interesting. So one of my hobby horses is to uh, explain to American evangelicals that they're actually way more influenced by Plato than they'd like to believe. <laughs> that we're we're quite oh, sure. often very gnostic in uh, in the way yes. that we approach one another. So, yes. Anyway, um, that's fascinating. Well, so okay, so you turn to philosophy. You're reading all this yep. stuff. What do you? What are the questions specifically that you're considering? And then how do you? How do you end up? How does that end up kind of turning you back toward faith? Yeah. So like we said, a lot of these questions were about knowledge and certainty and how faith relates to that. And today I have a very nuanced view of how all that goes together. 
And I tend to think that really all human knowledge is faith-based. We all have faith. Mm. We all have to have faith. Um, and that applies to pretty much every, every area of our lives. And on a daily basis, we're constantly placing faith in different things without even thinking about it. Um, but at the time I was so hung up on this idea of certainty, I have to be absolutely certain. And so, like I said, I was wrestling through those questions. And I think as I thought through it more and more, I realized that the kind of certainty I was looking for is actually humanly impossible. Hmm. You can't actually have the kind of certainty that I was looking for. Um, And there's a lot of nuance there, but I kind of came to that conclusion and that realization that the certainty I was looking for was kind of, it was kind of this expectation or this standard that a human being actually can't reach. Yeah. That the only being who can would be God himself. Yeah. Who would have that kind of knowledge and that kind of certainty. And so part of it, I think, was coming to terms with human limitations themselves, with the limitations that we naturally have as human beings, as being finite, as being fallible, right? Yeah. And I I wasn't able to come to those terms at an early age, but the more I contemplated, the more I reflected, the more I realized that a lot of what I was wrestling with were my own limitations. Wow. Unpack that a little bit. Yeah, just in terms of the human mind is limited. There are so many things that we can't know. There are so many things that we can't know for certain because we are creatures in time. Right. Um, We can't be everywhere at the same time. We We can't see everything at the same time. And so we have these natural limitations um, that we simply can't transcend. And part of being a human being, I think is accepting those limitations and yeah, but part most, of that is ex- most yeah, people yeah. don't go for that. They don't have to accept that until they're much older. Yeah. 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 Right. Most people are like in their twenties, like I'm invincible. Wow. Right. <laughs> Spring break 2021. Right. Like, look at that. Nobody cared. Um, but so like you just wrestling with that early, right? Wrestling with that kind of as a, as a really young man is kind of fascinating. That's a, that's a really interesting and unique perspective. Um, okay. So how, so did you come to the conclusion then that not only is it that uh, like humans have this sort of limit on the knowledge that we can sure access, right? Yeah what we can actually know, but did you, did you conclude, well, okay, maybe God knows more? For sure. Yeah. Was there, was there like, so what I want to know is I want to hear a story. So was, was there like a moment you were like <laughs> reading, you know, I don't know, Kant or somebody and like, Oh, that's it. Bing light bulb goes on. Or how did that happen? So for me, it was more just in terms of, personal contemplation. I would like, so this was the big question that I was asking is just about human knowledge and how we um, apprehend knowledge, how much can we know, and how does faith relate to that? I think that was my big question. And so I would take notes on this all the time and I would think through it and I had a notebook and I would write pages and pages and pages just like going through like all these premises uh, to reach a conclusion kind of thing. And I think I reached a point where I finally reached my conclusion that basically, I think like to put it in very elementary terms that certainty is not a human possibility. And so all humans have to exercise faith. It just depends on what my faith is in and how well supported that faith is by reasons or by rational arguments. Yeah. See, I think that's totally true. We all have to put faith in something. So how did you decide that, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put my faith in God? Yeah. No, great question. 
Um, that, ironically, wasn't so much an intellectual thing. I mean, my intellectual journey helped to break down barriers, to break down walls and, and things that were in the way of making a decision, right? But really, me coming back to the faith of my childhood was about God, not about me. It was about his grace and what he mm. did in my life, not about me finding him, but him finding me, if that makes sense. Yep. So when I was around 20 years old, I had a very dramatic conversion experience that mirrored my experience when I was 12 years old and lost my faith. Oh, wow. it, con- it contrasted it. And it came about... And I I remember the moment very vividly, just as vividly as I remember that moment when I was 12 years old. And I was in the same bed (laughs) that I was in when I lost my faith, which is kind of funny now thinking about it. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I had the desire to open up my Bible. Okay. And, uh, and again, I was still like active in church. Like I was in the, the worship band um, right. Like, wow. but I didn't have like a personal devotional life because I was wrestling with all these things. This makes me question everyone at my church, <laughs> <but> just everybody. <laughs> They're all suspect now. Um, so I had this weird desire to open up my Bible. So I opened up the Bible and it was the gospel of John. And as I was reading John, the words came alive, right? Like the gospel of John became alive. It became the most real thing. It was like, it was becoming the word of God to me, right? And when I read the words of Jesus, those words became living and active, Mm. sharper than any double-edged sword, right? And penetrating my heart and my soul. And when I was reading the words of Jesus, it was as if God himself was speaking to me. And that's something that, you know, if you haven't had an experience like this, it's hard for me to articulate and explain, but you have to be in my skin and experience what I experienced. And it was, it was a powerful moment and, um, it just changed me in an instant. Like, Back when I was 12 years old and I lost my faith in God, that experience was instantaneous, right? Like I lost my faith in a moment. And when I was 20 years old and I had this conversion experience, what took place was instantaneous. It was in a moment. My heart was changed. My mind was changed. My life was changed. Wow. That is really fascinating. So sort of bookends to that little desert journey you took through philosophy. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So, uh, what are the, like, what are the, what are the lessons you take from that experience, from, from those two experiences, from that sort of, I just called it the desert journey. Oh, that is a tough question. That's what we do here, um, Ryan. We ask tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Now I'm not. You don't even have to yeah, apply yeah. to everybody else. Like I don't care. So our fr- friends, you know, you have to take draw conclusions from your own story. But so sure. for, you, for you, like, what is it that you look at and you go, "I look at that season now, and I learned this about me and my relationship with God." Yeah, I think I think there's several things. I think one thing is just because you have doubts doesn't mean the answers to those doubts don't exist. Just because you lack a knowledge of information doesn't mean that the information doesn't exist. And I think so much of our walks with God have to do with will. Mm. I think that to know God, you have to want to know God. You have to have a will and a desire to know God. 
to come to, to faith in God, I think in a lot of ways you have to want that. Mm. And I think that maybe some people don't experience God because they're not seeking God or they're not wanting that experience. I don't want to overgeneralize because sure. there are people who have sought after God and haven't had experiences like that. So I don't want to overgeneralize and there's always exceptions to the rule. But I think one thing, just looking at my life subjectively, is even when I didn't have faith in God and I couldn't believe in God, I still had a desire to believe. And I think that was something that enabled me to find answers that I didn't have at the time and allowed me in some ways to have the experience that I did when I was 20. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think there's something in there about what Jesus says, right? He says, seek and you will find, you know? Yes. And so, and then one thing that's been really fascinating to me over the last few months is the parables that Jesus tells about like um, the treasure in a field, right? Like the guy goes and sells everything so he could buy this field because the treasure that's, that's in it and like how the gospel is like that, right? The kingdom of God is like that. That's interesting. So you, like you were seeking, you were looking, you were looking for that yeah. thing that was super valuable. Right. And in the end, yeah. it sounds like almost it didn't matter what your questions or the answers to them were. It was really God's choosing in a moment to yes, give you almost this mystical experience where you went, Oh, this is who Jesus is. And it all made sense. Yes. Yeah. And so it kind of shows this relationship between nature and grace, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately grace is far more powerful though. You can't separate them in this very simplistic black and white manner that we've, that I think we've done in a lot of Protestant denominations, for example. Yeah. And that's a Western thing too. Right. It is a Western thing. Yeah. Which is one reason I'm going to do a little traveling because I think we, we need to get, <laughs> gotta get outside of that because you, it, there really is yeah. a lot more even to our faith than the Western tradition can offer. Yeah, for sure. Fascinating. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So that was when you were 20. So what happened from there? Yeah. Like, how did you, how yeah. did you start to, where'd your faith go from that, from that point? Yeah. So real quick, if I can go back and talk yeah. about, um, because when we talk about conversion or in the Christian faith, we call it regeneration. We believe that there are effects of that, that there are, are, that there's fruit of conversion or fruits of that experience. And for me, there were three main things that I can point to of what was the result of that experience. And the first thing was, I always had a looming fear of death. Mm. Um, th throughout my adolescence, I always had this fear of death that was hanging over my head like a dark cloud. And it was just something that I could never get over. It was always there, always kind of gnawing at me, which is kind of weird to say, because again, you, you yeah. alluded to it earlier that like, Teenagers often feel like they're invulnerable, like they don't think about death, like they can't, you know, they're immune to that, right? Yep. But I always had this gnawing fear of death. And in that moment, my fear of death just went away completely. Wow. And so that's that's one of the the fruits of of that experience. Another one was that of course like when you're like 20 years old you think a lot about obviously girls and dating and maybe even marriage if you're thinking that early. Mm -hmm. Uh in that moment in that conver conversion experience I lost my desire for a romantic relationship. Like that went away immediately. Hmm. Which is, which is interesting. And that lasted yeah. for several, it lasted for several years, but I think that leads into the third fruit of this conversion experience, which was just a total reorientation of my priorities. Mm. 
Like God became ultimate and everything else was penultimate. God became primary. Everything else was secondary and tertiary. Um, everything else in my life, my aspirations, my goals, my dreams, my desires, they all really paled in comparison to God. And that was something that I experienced just right away Hmm. during that time. Did people notice that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. My, my youth pastor during the time, I think definitely noticed it the most. Yeah. Yeah. Did he say something that was like, Hey, what happened to you, man? He did. Yeah. He did uh, say some things to me about it. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I'm just really interested in that. Okay. So, you, so this rearranges your priorities and makes you think, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to worry about God. So that take you to school, did you change majors? Yeah. Did you go to seminary? What'd you do? Yeah. So I really felt called into ministry at that time, but I didn't know exactly what I should do. And so I decided to study theology since it went along with my intellectual journey at that time. Yep. Um, it was an opportunity to learn more. And so I, uh, went to college, studied theology, but I developed really, really bad OCD habits in college. And anxiety was something that I always struggled with, but some of my anxiety started to come back in college. And a lot of it was just because of school. Um, I'm an extreme perfectionist. I have really high standards for myself, unrealistic standards. And school brought out the worst in me with my OCD and my anxiety. And so that was like a big development when I went to school. I became obsessed with learning. I was dead set on being a professor. And, but all of that kind of irritated my anxiety and my OCD. And yeah, so I decided to go to grad school from there because my whole goal, like I want to be a professor. I feel called to teach. And I found a grad school where I was able to split my degree program in terms of um, I took like half of my my credits were philosophy, half of my credits were theology. So that was awesome. But my anxiety and OCD just became more and more paralyzing during that mm-hmm. time. Okay, so what is how how the that's really that's fascinating too. Um, like so that's interesting. So then you go from not believing to believing, and then to struggling. Like the whole, the whole different thing. With, for sure. With for the sure. Lord. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, how'd you, how'd you resolve that or how that, uh, what was that experience like? Sounds like it was yeah, so, kind of crippling. Yes. It, it got to a point where I had to leave graduate school and it got so bad that I had to go back and live with my parents. And I got to a point where I was basically on the brink of insanity and some people might even say that I was insane. And oh, I'll just wow. give you, I'll just give you one example. My OCD was so bad. I was diagnosed at this time with a severe anxiety disorder and severe OCD. And it got to the point where I would walk into a room and I had this irrational fear that every time I took a step, like everything on the walls would fall down, like all the art, all the pictures, everything hanging on the walls. Every time I took a step that they would all fall down. And so like, I would literally stand in the middle of a room and be too scared to take a step. Wow. And I would eventually (laughs) find the will to leave the room, but then I would fear that like everything had fallen down. And so I'd go back to the room and I would do this over and over again. Mm. And that's, and that's not even to speak of like what it was like to brush my teeth or to shut off a faucet or to lock a door. Like I had come to, a situation in my life where I really felt like life was not worth living anymore. And it's, it's something that I would not wish on my worst enemy. It was awful. And I probably would have killed myself. I probably would have taken my life if I did not believe in God. Wow. It was, it was my belief in God that kept me from doing that, that basically in a, in a sense saved my life and kept me alive. Yeah. So how did, how did you, I mean, is that something you're still struggling with or how did that, uh, how'd you treat that? No. So, um, certainly not anywhere near to that extent. Thank God. Um, but during that time, so I was living at home 
I was on, you know, I'd been diagnosed with these disorders. I was on medication. Um, I was taking a bunch of different medications and nothing was working. Like I was saw a psychiatrist. Um, I think I saw some counselors during that time as well. And just nothing was working and things were actually getting worse and worse and worse. But I felt like God was nudging me to, I was dating a girl long distance at a time at that time. And I felt like I was nudging me to go to California to see her. And it sounds super weird because here I am like basically on the brink of insanity. And I feel like God is nudging me to do this. And how am I going to, how are my parents going to allow me to, cause I'm living in Michigan and my girlfriend is living in California. Yeah. And I'm trying to convince my parents or my mom that I need to drive out to California to see my girlfriend. <laughs> and I'm in this condition. And somehow I convinced them to allow me to do that. Uh, my aunt went with me, but we drove okay. out to California. Right, somebody's we- got to go with you, man. We can't, <laughs> yeah. The last thing we need is you being in a gas in a truck stop and not yeah. able to leave. Nobody wants that. Oh, for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, seriously. Um, so we drive out to California. And one of the greatest miracles in my life happened uh, when I got there. So I stayed with a friend the first night when I was in the LA area. And then my girlfriend, Courtney, my future wife, she came to pick me up. And again, you have to understand like the depth of what I was going through. Mm -hmm. Um, This anxiety and this OCD, like anybody who's experienced the severity of this kind of thing, it's uncontrollable. Like, and you try so many different things and none of it works and you're just getting worse and worse and worse. And you feel like there's, there's no remedy. And so go out to California, stay with a friend. Um, my future wife, Courtney comes to pick me up. And I remember this moment as vividly as I remember when I lost my faith, when I was 12 years old, when I regained it, when I was 20 years old, I um, went outside because my wife, Courtney had come to pick me up and I saw Courtney, she was wearing a white dress. And as soon as I saw her, the moment I saw her months of uncontrollable anxiety and crippling OCD went away in an instant, instantaneously. Just like how I lost my faith, just how I regained my faith. Wow. All of this went away in an instant. And I felt peace and rest for the first time in so long. You have to understand, like, I was severely sleep deprived, mm-hmm. horrible insomnia. I, could, I was on, like, a half hour of sleep every day. Wow. Um, and all of these feelings went away in an instant. And that was probably the greatest um, like dynamic miracle that I've ever experienced in my life. And it's something that I'll never forget. And in that moment, I felt like God was basically telling me that this was the person that he wanted me to spend the rest of my life with. This was the person that he wanted me to journey through my life with. And so, you know, um, very quickly or several months go by and we get engaged, we get married. And, um, I tried to go back to graduate school and pursue my PhD again, um, because I am a never say die kind of person <laughs> yep. and I will, I will keep going and keep trying to do things until it's impossible. Yeah. That's that Midwest work ethic, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I did that and my anxiety came back, my OCD came back and I finally reached a point where I think I realized that this wasn't what God wanted me to do. If he wanted me to do it, he would have allowed me to do it without this anxiety and without this OCD. And so to me, God was closing the door on my pursuit of teaching in college. And he was using anxiety in a way to tell me that. But I didn't realize that. And the only way that I would realize that is if I just kept going and kept going. And then Mm -hmm. 
it was finally made clear that God was, was shutting this door and that it wasn't a door that I was going to be able to get through. Yeah. Wow. Which is, that's, that's a tough decision, right? Yeah. To make, but I suppose if your mental health is so troubled by it, then that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Well, wow. what's your, what's your uh, future wife feel? How'd she feel about that whole process? <laughs> I mean, you well, don't have to speak I, for her, but I'm just curious. No. Yeah. Yeah. So Courtney, my wife is a, is a pastor's kid. So she grew up in ministry. All her uncles are pastors basically. And she never wanted to be the wife of a pastor. She didn't want to be in that position. She never wanted to do that. And so she, I think, liked the idea of being the wife of a teacher or a professor, but never wanted to be the wife of a pastor. So when I had come to this realization that this wasn't what God was leading me to, that he essentially didn't want me at that time to be a professor, um, and that that would mean that I would have to look for other practical ministry positions, uh, you know, Courtney wasn't super excited about it, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but yeah, so we started to look for other ministry opportunities and we found an opportunity to plant a house church in Colorado and Colorado is the state that my wife grew up in. And so we found an opportunity based on previous connections or relationships that she had made in the state. Yeah. I love that. And how'd that go? Yeah. So, um, our house church was basically built after the model of the early church in acts of the primitive Christian community. And so it was a church for anyone and everyone. So whether you were religious or not, whether you were a Christian or you weren't a Christian, uh, regardless of what denomination you grew up in or what kind of church you attended, like everyone was welcome. And it was set up in a way where we met on Monday nights. Every Monday night, we would share, share a meal. Um, everyone, everyone would participate in some sense, like maybe bringing a side dish or bringing ingredients, but, you know, we would cook and share a meal together. Um, we would do a lesson, we would pray, and then we would hang out and play games. And we did this for about four years. And we actually walked through the gospel of Matthew verse by verse for four years. And it was very challenging, but it was also very rewarding. It was challenging in the sense that it's very difficult to speak to such a diverse group about difficult things in a very intimate environment. Um, That is very challenging. It was rewarding (laughs) in the sense that, I mean, in so many ways, we were kind of living out that early church model. And there was this this great family tight-knit kind of family dynamic that was being created. And it's something that I believe, you know, the church should be and what the church should essentially look like. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Uh, okay. So then you, so last year we, we started to talk about this, but I want to just end up on this. So all of these experiences, I can see now how they sort of lead into you doing a podcast about this yeah. sort of, thinking and, uh, you know, sort of philosophical ideas of, you know, questions that people are asking, but nobody's talking Well, maybe some people are talking about, but trying to make it a little bit more accessible. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that so many of these experiences have shaped me, of course, in terms of just the value of the mind and thinking, but also in terms of sound communication as well. Because I think within the context of the house church, you have to learn how to not just think well, but communicate well and communicate to to each person within their own context, to speak to each person on their own level and in a way that they can appreciate, which which is very difficult. And learning how to 
take essentially the gospel or the Christian message and contextualize that in a way that people who didn't grow up in church can understand and can appreciate. And so the values of sound thinking, the values of sound communication, and then about, of course, the big questions of life and and really important issues. Yeah. So like, give me an example of what that means. Really important issues. Let me think. So I'll, I'll give an example of a couple seasons that, that we've done and, and seasons that we'll continue to do on thinker sensitive. So, um, one of them, well, the first two were really about thinking about thinking and thinking about communication and how to have a fruitful conversation, how to have constructive dialogue with others. Um, and that involves uh, approaching a conversation with openness and trying to divorce oneself from bias and from prejudice and from presuppositions and thinking in a clear way that isn't diluted by our, our biases. Um, so a lot of that has to do with sound thinking and then communicating in a way that isn't overly, um, dogmatic and objective that, that verbalizes or puts off a sense of openness where you can have an interchange of ideas and you can have a fruitful dialogue. So I've, I've talked a lot about the importance of thinking well and communicating well and how that really opens up dialogue. Yeah. But then as, as we move forward, now I want to think well and communicate well about big questions, right? And so in a couple seasons, I'm going to deal with the question of God, which of course is the biggest question for me. So essentially why I believe that God exists and thinking well about that question and communicating well about that question. This episode and all episodes of Thinker Sensitive are available on thinkersensitive.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app today to listen to more thought-provoking content from Thinker Sensitive.